you oppose the capital punishment, why is it more moral to put someone in jail for life? Well, again, I don't uh, believe that it's, it's more moral. I just believe it's the, it's the right thing to do. If a person, as I said before, if a person commits a, a serious heinous crime, you lock them up and you throw away the key. The moment that you're s sentencing them to death and subjecting them to basically the same crime that they committed, you've lost all moral grounds whatsoever. Are you comfortable with that, Krista? Yeah, I'm very comfortable with that. I mean, I have issues with the prison system, but that's for another mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a whole different show. Mm -hmm. I'm not comfortable with it. It might surprise you to know that I'm not comfortable with life without parole. I don't think that's a moral sentence. I don't get it, in short. If someone has done something that is so heinous, so egregious, so cruel, so callous, that they deserve to lose all hope, they deserve to lose their life, if we think that they can be and they, that we should care about whether they're rehabilitated as a human being, I don't see why we should for, forever foreclose the possibility of saying, this person has grown so, this person has matured so, this person has acquired a dignity, a humanity, a richness that the person now does has come to deserve their freedom. Well, I, there's a difference between uh, somebody who just goes from a store and robs somebody who, because of their crackhead and shoots the, the attendant and goes to jail for murder, and somebody who's a, a predator, a serial killer, uh, a predator, a pedophile killer. These people obviously have serious mental illnesses, and obviously these things are not going to be adequately addressed by the prison system. If anything, they need to be under serious psychiatric care, not in a prison facility. But if Most they were... Of and they were cured. Let's just for the moment imagine that one of those folks was treated effectively and efficiently by psychiatrists and, and, and medically. Suppose we had chemicals that could change and, then, well, and they were no longer a threat. There is a, there is a Would case you release of Michael, them? No. There's a case of Michael Ross in Connecticut and he had gone and killed over a dozen women. Uh, he's on death row right now, but he was never getting. Uh, he had basically a form of schizophrenia. He was basically telling us uh, in some of the letters when we corresponded with him how it was like hearing a song in your head that you couldn't get out of your head, except it wasn't a song. It was thoughts of killing and raping women. After he was convicted, they then began giving him treatment in the prison with Deprovera, which is a drug that they use on psychiatric mm -hmm. patients who have this problem. After he started taking Deprovera, these cravings started going away. He no longer got the voices. He no longer got the urge to kill. Now, that's not to say this man should be released from jail now because he doesn't have that problem anymore. He's killed over a dozen women. He deserves to be locked up for the rest of his life. But at the same time, he also deserves to have that treatment. And other p individuals deserve to have that treatment, too, who are going to be incarcerated for the, left, the rest of the, right, the life for doing something. And, and what would be the quality of his life? What, how would you have him experience life day to day? Would he enjoy himself? Someone would he would, would he be given a new pair of pants? Exactly. You would have him. So you would have him the ple have the pleasure. I mean, I, I watched the Super Bowl. I mean, oh, that's what, I mean, that's American mm. football. But uh, uh, we know. Oh, how we're aware of that. Too, so. <laughs> More than half. I, I watched the Super Bowl with convicted killers one one day inside Lorton Prison, and it was in the middle of the game, and I was surrounded by these guys, all of whom had murdered, and oh, all but a couple of whom had murdered, and I withdrew from them for the moment. And I realized that if they ever opened up the cell right then and said, okay, you have three hours of freedom, that many of them would have stayed just where they were, with the cartons of cigarettes bet on the game, among their closest friends, that they were fully involved in life. And how fundamentally unfair that was. Michael? It was unfair that they were involved oh. with life? Yes, it was unfair that they got to experience, I mean, in that particular prison there was sex, drugs, and rock and roll, as there is in most of the prison, provided that you know where to go and who to, and who to go for it. Mm -hmm. that, that there was something fundamentally unfair that, that, that our response in the most egregious situations is to say, sure, continue to, to enjoy life. So should they suffer when they die more? I mean, is there a form of execution? Would you like executions to be more painful, more hideous? I can avoid the question by saying, I can avoid the question by saying constitutionally, if the Eighth Amendment, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment, means anything, it unquestionably historically means that we are a culture committed to eradicate torture. That is, we do, we do not permit torture. So we never, we never even get... Now, if you ask me morally, does Danny Rawling deserve to be tortured? In, in some level, he does. Would I have the state do it? No. But, but, and here's the big but, when he is executed, do I think he deserves a quick but painful death? Yes, I do. I, I think n not in many cases. It depends upon if you are someone who yourself tortured and in that way and took the pleasure. How we die is important since we all appear that we're going to die. There's something very appropriate about his going out in pain, but not being tortured. Mike. Well, I'm, I'm very impressed with your moral reasoning. Uh, I have not uh, surveyed a random sample of Canadians or Americans with debates like this, but I do know that when we do ask follow-up questions and this and that and the other thing, and we kind of try to replicate what, what an argument would be on the issue, people become less in favor 
as they as they think through uh, the issue uh, of uh, of the death penalty. And and in a sense, you know, when I t look at compare our two democracies, the more direct democracy that you have in, in America, and our what is our representative democracy uh, is more of a deliberative democracy. And so when we vote, it, it seems maybe a little bit more authoritarian. We vote for these parliamentarians. They go to Ottawa and they debate issues like this, and they are slightly ahead of public opinion, but it's interesting that when it comes to the next election, they're not punished for this. In other words, there is a sense of a kind of a deference that maybe people have thought this through. Well, well and, you and, had and, a question and, also and, you know, for Robert. Well, I, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, Robert, are you, are you advocating you know, the death, that, that Canada should reinstate the, uh, uh, the death penalty, or do you think it's fine the way we do things, and we're an experiment, we're another experiment on this... Uh, on this continent, on this planet, of, a, of, an, of another way to go? Well, you, I mean, you, you have your own autonomy, and so, of course, it's a, it's a decision for Canadians to make and not for us to make for you. Uh, do, do you have your own Paul Bernardos? Is that, is, do, yeah. I have the, do I have the right yeah. name? Yeah. Uh, yes, apparently you do. Does he deserve to die? Yes, he does, from what I know. Do I wish that you would have executed him? Yes, I do wish that you would have executed him. So you him. think some people are just evil. You say you, you've looked at them, you've met them, and you think some people... Not all murders. And that's a very important point to make. Not only not only all murders, most murderers do not deserve to die. In the United States today, we have roughly 3,500 people on death row. Of those 3,500, the majority of them do not deserve to die. So circumstances, the offense itself and the individual, that's what makes the difference to you. You look at them and you go, there are, you are evil, you deserve to it, die. It's not just emotion. I mean, I've been accused here of just being emotional. Yes, I am emotional. It's informed emotion. It's also, it's reflective intuition. But we have a, 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 a process in which first there's a guilt phase and then there's a penalty phase. The question at the guilt phase is, did he do it, or she? Did, did he murder with these aggravating circumstances? But the question, and that, that just makes you death eligible. That doesn't, make you, that doesn't make you get the death penalty. The next question for the jury at the penalty phase is, do you deserve it? That question is a, is, a, is a different order of magnitude. That is a moral question. That's not strictly a and factual question. And that can't be question. properly legislated. Uh, when it you cannot. Look at the, when you look at right. things like victims' rights legislation, where they allow the victims to come up on the stand and testify about the, all the pain that they've gone through. So basically what you're saying is, in the event of a person being murdered, if it was um, a homeless prostitute who was murdered and she has no family or friends to come up it, during the victim impact statement and get the jury all riled up and upset, as you've expressed here today, then obviously they're going to be a lot less likely to go with a death sentence, whereas if the whole community comes out and speaks out and everyone gives a victim impact statement and has the jury all teary-eyed teary as they go off into deliberations, obviously they're going to be more likely to come back with a death sentence in that case. You, so there's no way to properly legislate what it is you say that you would like to see implemented. Let me just get a quick answer from, from all of you, which does sort of crystallize it here, and we've only got a minute or so. I mean, do you think a society is more civil, is a better society if it has no death penalty? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm reflecting on public opinion, and uh, I think when I take a look at the evolution of, of, of social values in Canada, I see a, a, an evolution away from uh, those traditional uh, values that, uh, in which uh, a violence was part of everyday life. I it was in the family, it was in the wider society, and I think that uh, as I'm uh, seeing the Europeans, the Canadians, and others, as they move from, from modernity to post-modernity, as they get high standards of living and so on, they start uh, developing their social values. Do you think it will and, evolve uh, that way in the States? I think a society is more civil if it has the death penalty but reserves it only for the worst of the worst. I think a society is uncivilized if it has a death penalty and it uses it indiscriminately. The, the, I'm just as much in opposition of the, uh, to the kill them all set who, who, who will indiscriminately execute as I am to the abolitionists. I think both of them are morally insensitive. I think both of them fail to make the crucial distinctions. Okay, I'm going to stop here. We've got a few questions from the audience, and we'll be back to hear them. And you were...